because I was astounded by the fact that I was like, you're this, but I know you are not that, you know, and I think that's the kind of beauty of theater is like, we don't meet Tom Hanks. So it's like when you're a child and you're watching something like big, you're like, oh, I guess that's who he is. You know, like that's just it's just it's just the story. You have no vision of like the person outside of the story. It's like your teacher lives at school. And then there's this sort of like, oh, I know you. I saw you before you went on stage yeah. when we went to dinner and now I'll see you after <laughs> yeah. the show out of costume. And yet for that brief moment between those two places, you were. Buddy Holly, High Pocket Stunk, whoever the character was. And I think the beauty of theater is like you get to witness that sort of transition between knowing full well that this is not who that person is, especially when they're a famous musician or, or icon in history or have any sort of historical significance. You're like, well, I know it's not them. And yet for a brief period of time, I believed it was. That was the voice of actor, musician, and playwright Michael Parid Jr., someone I am proud to call a colleague, a fellow artist and storyteller, and someone who impressed me so much I included stories about him in my book, This Above All. And yes, I do ask Michael to comment on those stories in this episode of the Page and Stage podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jason Cannon. And if you find value or just enjoy this podcast, I encourage you to forward it along. Share it with someone else who wants to dive deep into the art and craft of writing and performance. All storytellers and creative adventurers are welcome. Now, here's the scoop on Michael. He was born in Baltimore, graduated top of his class at Towson University with a BFA in acting, he then moved to New York City with his wife, Lacey Riley, where they pursued and lived the artist's life. They now live in Reston, Virginia, with their adorable dog, Roxy Hart. And Michael is a full-time equity actor, dramatist Guild of America writer, and composer lyricist. Michael has been seen all across the world on television, all across North America on several national tours, and across the country again in multiple regional productions. Michael also plays guitar, like, really, really well. So it's no surprise that he's best known as Buddy Holly. He's played Buddy in the show Buddy the Buddy Holly Story like eight or nine times, including once with me as his director. Michael has also shredded his guitar in multiple productions of Million Dollar Quartet. But for any other directors or producers listening out there, Michael wants to make it very clear he is certainly not limited to playing dead people with a guitar strapped to him. Here we go with my conversation with Michael Perry Jr. I am so lucky to be online here with the actor, playwright, lyricist, composer, multi-instrumentalist Michael Perry Jr. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh my gosh, thank you for having Absolutely. me. I'm so this excited. It's going to be so much fun. I'm going to start with, Mike, you love video games. But of course, now I have to ask, I have I to ask, what is your console of choice and what is your favorite game and why? Okay, okay. <laughs> PlayStation 5 is currently what is my main console. I have a Nintendo Switch as well, and I also am a PC gamer. Oh. So I have, I've always been a lifelong PC gamer. Since I was a kid, my dad and I built my first computer together, and so it was sort of like always an interesting thing in the background yeah. of my life. But then I sort of went to consoles for a while, and my wife plays games too, which is nice. So we get to play games together. So, so that is my current console. Uh, my favorite games of all time, I have like a top three that float back and forth. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, I think, is like, a lot of gamers, I think, would say that that's up there. The There's a game called Bioshock mm. Infinite. I'm a big fan of the Bioshock series. And the Infinite game just really blew my mind. And I've played it like three times through. I really think it's fa fascinating, wonderful game. And then what else do I love? I do love like The Last of Us, but I'm a sucker for like a good Star Wars game. I like Jedi, Fallen Order, and Survivor. I mean, I'm a huge Star Wars guy, so like... So I was just doing this play, and in the uh, the men's dressing room, I was, like, making these references to video <laughs> games. Because I was like, come on, you know, we're bros. Bros all play games, right, bro? Like, And so I was making these references. It's not cool at all. It's not. I'd never think of it as a cool, bro-y thing, because I grew up 
when it wasn't cool. And none of them were gamers. And it was a shock to me that they had no idea what I was ever talking about. And, and I was like, oh, I, I, I just I can't believe that I just assumed that you would know that you all had some experience with video games. And they're like, yeah, no, we never really played. Them. I was like, oh. <laughs> And then, and then I would go to the girls and I would talk to the girls and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, you know what you're talking Like some of them are gamers more than the, and I was just like, this is a true flip of like the, I think the ideal script, like the, the idea that like all yeah. men play games and they love video games and women don't play video games. It's like, no, not true. And it just really never thought it would ever impact a moment of a conversation yeah. <laughs> in my life until that happened. And I thought, oh my gosh, like I made a, I made an assessment yeah that was sexist yeah. in my mind thinking that all the men would know what i was talking about and they did not they knew nothing about it so i i am always astonished by the reach and the power of yeah the- uh i had a i know you do voiceover work too but i'm curious i had a guest on a, a few weeks ago rod brogan who has performed mm. like full not just voice acting for video games but full, I you love know, rod. Rod, but full body performance capture yeah. Um, have yeah. you got to do any of that for video games? Like be one of the performers? I'm usually, hey, I would love to do that. I, it's like a dream of mine is to do that. I um found myself like I was just, like doing a lot more of composing for like friends when they would make like little games and stuff like that. I would be the one writing the little theme that you'd hear over and over again. Or I'd be like the voice of like the 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 the, the, the menu because I have that sort of like you know, menu. I think I, I, I must have a menu voice or like radio right. commercial sounding voice sometimes. I think if I fall into that sort of deeper <laughs> tones, then I sound like I'm saying something really. Oh, important. it could be movie trailer uh, voice even. Like, yeah. choose your character, you know, like that sort of thing. So, no, but I would love to. And I love. I got to tell you, my, I used to be big on the various Nintendo consoles because my brother saved up as a kid and bought one and he and I were always playing. But the game that ruined games for me was red dead redemption i finished that game what happened and it was like i had gone through oh i love that game a narrative like it was a play it was a film it was epic and when i finished and you know it has that little tag so you play the main character through these hours and then he gets gunned down at his house and there's no way to win right it's a tragedy it's like 70 80 hours yeah the the main character is gunned down at his house no matter how good you've gotten at the game it's just that's the story but then it jumps ahead and you play the so sun sad. and the sun goes out. You get another like bonus couple hours of playtime to go get revenge. Redemption. Yeah. <laughs> hey, when I finished that, when I finished it's so that good. game, it's I so almost good. Cried. I sat there stunned like yeah. after a movie or a play or a good book. And I just, I couldn't believe it was over. I couldn't believe it was over and no video game ever. Yeah. I tried it, just nothing yeah, could live up. So I don't play anymore. Cause I just, I, I want to keep that pristine memory. Nothing but I'm wondering for that. you is because it's video gaming I is totally... such a specific storytelling modality now. A lot of the games you just mentioned that are your favorites, Bioshock, yeah, and it is. you know, The Last of Us. I mean, it's these. Even though there's lots of action, there are these huge sweeping narratives. And I'm wondering if that's part of the appeal for you is oh, that yeah. it's actually you're living a story. You're the narrator of a story. You didn't mention any sports games. You didn't mention Tetris. You mentioned these yeah. epic story games and i'm curious if that's kind of part of what's wired into you i think so i think what makes it beautiful and i think what people are 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 understanding about it why i think video games have become such a i've always wanted to use this word in a in a in a cool intellectual way are are so in the zeitgeist (laughs) um is nailed it (laughs) is 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 that that, yes i'm so smart i think the reason why they are so popular is that like it gives people a way to like be a part of the movie now it's like they used to be different i mean to be fair i think a lot of people's entry was probably like nes snes playstation one and it's like you kind of didn't have as much freedom and control yeah. as you do now because the technology couldn't account for yeah. choice. You know, it was like, you could say yes or no, but that's not going to impact it. And then games like Fable came out when Xbox, the first Xbox came out. I would say Xbox One, but there's an Xbox One, which right. is actually the fourth <laughs> Xbox. And the original X, I know it's crazy. The original Xbox, their game called Fable came out where like, you could sway your influence in the game by the decisions you made with NPCs. 
And you could say, like, if you turn them down or you stole from them or you killed them, other people in the world would start yep. to dislike you. And therefore, you would have a different ending because yep. they hated you. And so you would become an enemy and not the hero. And that was the first time where it's like, whoa, you really have sway over the, the, the world where, like, if you play good, you get a good ending. You play bad, they want to kill you and you become the villain of the story. I think it's fascinating. And then games like started to run with that. And now you have these massive games. I'm playing Fallout 4 now. I started playing before the show came out. And then it's like really cool that the show, I mean, look at The Last of Us, Fallout. It's like these games that are, are becoming, becoming narrative. television yeah, series. Yeah. Halo, even though that show is. Yeah, it's like they're finding ways to go. OK, so you don't play it. That's fine. But the story is still there yeah. and it's really good. So like, trust me, the, the, the world building here is beyond, it's truly beyond the scope of, I think, almost any other medium. When you think about the world building, I mean, there's like playing Fallout 4 right now, any of the Fallout games, but specifically for New Vegas. And it's like you go into a place and you're like, you know, on a mission to kill some monsters or something. And then you find a computer, you turn on the computer and there's emails and there's like a narrative story about this business that you're actually in that exploded yeah. hundreds of years ago but you're finding like they wanted to fire sean and then like sean replies and he's like i can't believe you're trying to knock me out of the it's nothing to do with the game at all and yet it is like so richly built in that you're like oh people yeah. were living here they had a life this was a business this was like some drama was going on here or some stupid thing like we wanted to rebrand the name of our toy and that's in the emails not a single impact on the game except whatsoever except but like to the player yeah, it's so immersive is that for you the player though that level of three-dimensionality what what happens when you when you're walking through for those who don't know listening yeah. fallout is based on it's a post-apocalyptic landscape right, right and you're navigating through like the, all these different monsters or people who have become monsters because of radiation or blah 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 but to walk into a burned out right, business right and see all these emails about marketing yes. brand decisions it's oh it becomes poignant right it there's a there's a i, I know it's we're going super so deep and nerdy on this bike but i the whole point is storytelling on this podcast i but know that's but the point of that email yeah from sean about branding when yeah. you're trying to survive a post-nuclear apocalyptic wasteland that it's exactly right the player suddenly has that feeling that emotional reaction of poignancy of life is fragile and precious and those little day-to-day -day things we do and fleeting it's, it's freaking and... our town right it's does anyone know how beautiful they are yes it's the humanity <laughs> of the little the humanity that comes yeah. out of the mundane when you've lost all else it's like i think it's where nostalgia lives and it's that sort of magical place where like you find the thing that you didn't care so much about your whole life but you saw it when you were a child and suddenly it becomes very important and it almost becomes a part of a piece of your entire identity because of what it did for you for a brief, maybe even day or two or a week when you were yeah. 10. It's like, oh, yeah, that was huge for me. And so now, like Pokemon, <laughs> I think about Pokemon, it's like I'm the right age for when I was eight years old, 1998, Pokemon, the games for the Game Boy and the cards came out. And I was right there and I was so into it. There's pictures of me. I was singing the theme song on videos from home videos. I was like dancing around <laughs> with my Pokeball. I was playing the games. I was at oh the conventions gosh. and I was like in front of a giant Pikachu, like a as a kid. Yeah. Like it's so funny because like I was so into it. And now as an adult, I, I still love trading card games. I've just clicked up into Magic the Gathering, you know, and I became such a big fan of that. And it's like, I still remember it's like it's the nostalgia of like finding the old cards that you had in your in your parents basement and going oh man I loved this so yeah. much and it was like so important to me it was like the only thing that mattered and it's beautiful in that way so like all of that being said going back to the point it's like yeah when you find these things in these games this like extra lore that some writer was like wouldn't it be funny if like there was just like an email on this computer about finding this guy and that was like you know, like, you know, that they were just like, we're trying to figure out ways to fill out the world and let's like flush it out. Let's like, you know, you do this building, you do this building, write the emails and like, yeah, it means something like it. We're talking about it now. And it's like, I don't know that the person who wrote that for the game, what what was it? Eight years ago, this game came out like 
ever thought that I think two people would be like, hey, remember those emails from that one? <laughs> like, yeah, track down that like, person and like get them. Oh, it, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Like, sir, you, ma'am, you so sir, much. whoever you are, good job. You know, I'm going to pivot a little bit here. If you haven't Please. heard this podcast, Mike, The History of Rock in 500 Songs by Andrew Hickey, it is brilliant. Oh it is God. brilliant. Oh, One right of now. the points he brings up is that, you know, every people will go to the mat for their favorite music, right? And it's always music from there. That is true. They've done studies on this, that if you know someone's age, you can tell what their favorite music is because it's the music of their mid to late teens and early 20s. And it's set like a mosquito in amber, right? Yes. Like it, we have far less choice about it than we think. We have far less right. taste than we think, right? It's set for us because it's what we're growing up. Through. It's your Pokemon cards, right? Right. And to that point, I think this is a great pivot into... Right. It's, yes, the, it's exactly. nostalgic. And you, I've, I've lost Please. count, Mike, but you and I met when I was directing Buddy, Buddy Holly story and you were Buddy. You were right. Buddy Holly. And you've played Buddy on the national tour. You've played Buddy. What, what was right. it now? I know you've retired from Buddy, but it was it 11? Yeah, eight times. Was it? I've, I've played Buddy eight times, but I've done this show yeah. kind of nine times. Man, oh, man. Maybe nine and a half. There was like a pop up <laughs> <Buddy. laughs> where I played guitar because they needed somebody. They wanted, they needed a Tommy in the back to play guitar, and I, it was like a two a weekend of shows. And I was like, sure, I know it. That's yeah, yeah. It has been a, a big yeah, part. So of I'm just, this is I'm just I'm just going to kind of give you a long on ramp here, Mike, because I don't want to put words in your mouth on this, but playing Buddy Holly, this iconic, and not this goes past history into iconography into I mean. And your you, your performance was consistently praised right. across the productions for not being impersonation or caricature, and I think that's such a testament to you because that's the trap of the play. But what what did it do to you, sure, as an actor, as a musician, as a human, to play Buddy Holly so many times? I remember during our production in an interview, you once said to the the news reporter, "You know, I have sung Buddy Holly songs." more often than he did by a factor of 10 right because his career was so compressed and tragically short at least so you now have performed buddy holly you've yeah yeah you've given more buddy holly concerts than buddy holly ever did what has that experience done to you like did you and what did you learn along the way like the first time you play buddy what that feel like and then by time eight is it like oh there's nothing left to or is there like i learned something else too so that's a huge question. I'm just kind of setting that up. Uh, it's, it's Mike and Buddy. That is a huge question. Okay. I'll begin at the big wine. The first time I ever played Buddy, I, I mean, I have a history with the show in the way that I think is very strange that a lot of people are astonished and sort of mesmerized by, which is that when I was a kid, my cousin and my uncle were in productions right. of Buddy, that's the right. Buddy Holly story. And when I was like seven or eight years old, I saw my cousin play Buddy and my uncle play High Pockets Duncan. For those listeners who know nothing about Buddy Holly, he was sort of like the radio DJ in Texas that in, in, in Lubbock that gave him his first sort of chance. And in the show, he's sort of like a mentor. And they were in that production. And I saw that production as a kid when I was like eight. I think I was eight years old. And I was like, I want to do theater and I want to play guitar. Like from that point. I was interested in theater. And then eventually, I think it was 10 when I first started learning how to play the guitar. It's hard to play guitar when you're eight. I'm always astounded when I see like videos of kids who are like really young playing in intricate, you know, finesse instruments like a guitar, like where it's so hard for adults to learn it because it's painful and, and, and the fretboard is so long and wide. It's like when I see that, it's always remarkable to me. So I had a hard time learning it at first, but then I, so anyway, I got into theater from that and started taking like courses at the community college. It sort of pivoted my whole life because I was astounded by the fact that I was like, you're this, but I know you are not that, you know, I think that's the kind of beauty of theater is like, we don't meet Tom Hanks. So it's like when you're a child and you're watching something like big, you're like, oh, I guess that's who he is. You know, like that's just it's just it's just the story. You have no vision of like the person outside of the story. It's like your teacher lives at school. And then there's this sort of like, oh, I know you. I saw you before you went on stage yeah. when we went to dinner and now I'll see you <laughs> yeah. after the show out of costume. And yet for that brief moment between those two places, you were 
Buddy Holly, High Pockets Duncan, whoever the character was. And I think the beauty of theater is like you get to witness that sort of transition between knowing full well that this is not who that person is, especially when they're a famous musician or, or icon in history or have any sort of historical significance. You're like, well, I know it's not them. And yet for a brief period of time, I believed it was. And that was really fascinating to me. I don't think I thought of it like that. I think I was like, cool, people right, clap for right. you, you know, at the time. At the time. You, didn't, you didn't yet know the word zeitgeist. That's how you get into it. I think people, no, I didn't. I, I did not know zeitgeist. And so I was a fool. I was a foolish eight-year-old boy who was not aware of any German words except for Gesundheit. And the fascinating thing about it, I think, was that like, but it was something cool about it that there's like this mask, this identity, this change of self that is so transparent and yet so powerful that really it, I look back on it now and I'm like, well, that's what I feel about it now that I think is fascinating. So I must have had some sort of inclination in the simplicity of like, you were this, now you're this, and now you're back to yourself again. How cool is that? And so, yeah, that 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 started my journey. So I knew Buddy's music since I was a child. I mean, like I was into Buddy Holly. The first songs I was learning on the guitar was like Zeppelin and oddly enough, Buddy Holly. And then like, and then years later, yeah, I was in New York, living in New York. I was doing like downtown theater, you know, that sort of crazy, weird stuff that you do when you don't know what you're doing. And I saw that they were bringing the show on tour. And I was like, I can't believe this show's being done still. Like it, it had left my mind for so long. And so I sent in a video of me like playing like, that'll be the day or something. And Eventually, yeah, I got cast to play Buddy on the national tour. It was my first tour. It was my first big role as a performer outside of like, I had just moved to the city maybe like three years prior. So like I was just sort of doing little things here and there, just trying to be seen and, and working as a barista. And it was like, I got this tour and it was like lead role in a national tour. And suddenly I was going from making, you know, minimum New York minimum wage, which is, you know, worse than <laughs> everywhere because they go, well, you're getting tipped. It was like, so you're making like $3 an right. hour plus tips. It's, it's nonsense. And, and you're doing that and you're just working and you're doing little plays and your friends are doing a reading. So you go to the reading and you're just like hanging out and trying to make theater and writing to being like, oh, now you're making a thousand dollars a week and you're going to go on tour for three months. And see every state and be seen by thousands upon thousands of people it was mind-blowing to me it was like it was the best thing at the time that i could have asked for because it was like affirmation too that like oh you you know you you, you you're meant to do this you know someone sees that so yeah that was a huge huge jump i mean to go right to the national tour as the lead is insane for having never done it in my life. But I think that was part of their, the, the draw that they liked. They expressed that to me later on. That they were like, we just were fascinated by the fact that you had no inclination. You had no previous thing to bring that you were like, no, this is how I do it. And it was like totally fresh. Like most of the cast had either done it once or never done it before. And it oh, was wow, really that's, fascinating that's really uh, yeah. that they went with that. And I think that it was yeah. a benefit. Yeah, so then I ended up doing that, and then I did a regional production or two. Then I went. They asked me to go back on tour again, so I went back on the tour, and my wife came along as the company manager, and that was really cool. So we got the tour together, and so yeah, I've done it so many times. And at first, I think now when I look back on it, you know, all of that beautiful stuff that I said, valid. However, it was just nice to be the main character and have adoration. You know, at a certain point, it's like that was fueling sort of the negative part of my psyche mm -hmm. a little bit. I think now that I look back on it, it was like giving me sort of this, um, it was boosting my ego and I was filling my cup, as my therapist would say, filling my bucket with external oh. validation. And that's doesn't that doesn't really settle the cup. It just kind of fills it up and then you can spill it. And then you're like, oh, no, I have nothing now because I, you know, my shoes untied or whatever. Like you lose it all so quickly. And I think that was starting my journey to understanding like what 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 I wanted out of being an actor. But I didn't know it yet. And it took me, gosh, when was that 2015 when I when I went on tour for the first time and it took me until the pandemic, you know, so five, five more years before I started to realize that like who I was and what I was and the way that I was doing and why I was performing and acting was not healthy. And I think a lot of people I've expressed this to friends and, and I try to be very open about my journey now, like with everyone. I'm like, I'll tell you about the person I was was not the yeah. best version of me. 
and I fact, and in fact, I think that Buddy allowed me to wear the mask all the time, you know, because it was such a good fit for me because I genuinely believed, and I talked to my therapist about this too. This is a, this is a tie in. I feel like I'm starting to bounce. My ADHD is kicking in. So let me, yes. I'll bring it back in. Buddy for me was a, an interesting way to like fill the, fill the bucket, but it was, I had this belief that I was really going to die young and that this, this sort of cosmic connection that like, one person can't do so much because I was just trying to do everything all the time. I was always exhausted and I never gave myself any grace. I was constantly trying to do all the time because the moment I stopped doing, I felt oh, like okay, yeah. And so I would just be like, when I wasn't auditioning and I wasn't working, yeah, when I wasn't auditioning, if I wasn't working, then I was writing. I was trying to film like sketches. I was trying to get my friends to do readings and, and just, and I was building a theater company just to do and be busy. Um, without really thinking about like how it was impacting me, it was more of like well, I look like a actor and an artist, be- and so therefore I am. Everybody knows that because I'm showing it oh, all the time. Um, but I was kind of just forcing myself into the ground. I mean, I was so exhausted all the time, and I just didn't know it because I was just like, "This is what you do. This is how you do it." And so eventually, I started to realize that okay, maybe I'm doing this too much you know and, and and i'm pushing too hard and it was when the pandemic slowed yeah. everyone down which i think is it was horrible but there are i think some silver linings in the fact that everyone sort of went well i don't think we need to do all of this all of us all the time this is a lot we're we're asking a lot of ourselves too much like why do we need to go into the office for this job now we can telecommute right like ah oh, I don't have to go in and I have to deal with traffic and all of these hours I spent not doing anything. And, and, and for theater and for performers, I think it was like, do I want to do this? Now that I can't, I have no choice in the matter. I cannot do this. Therefore, do I still love it? Do I still want to do it? If there's anything else I want to do, now's my chance to give it a shot. And so I think a lot of us did. We were like, let's see what else I can do. And for me, it, it always stuck back to like creating was always the thing that I did. But when I got my dog, Bringing it back to the, to this whole st- <laughs> before before we began, listener, listen up. Before we began, Jason had asked me about therapy and my journey with therapy, and it began during the pandemic. And I got our dog, Roxy. <laughs> Tell me, I'm not a musical yeah. theater. Lover. <laughs> uh, Roxy Hart, our puppy, and she's a drama queen, so it fits. And uh, when she came along, I I realized that like my want to control and have this like version of myself and my world that I wanted picture perfect to be the thing that is the dream and the artist lifestyle. You can't really control an animal, (laughs) you know, you can't. So like when she wouldn't, like when she would, I'd be like, we pee outside and she'd be like, nah, on the floor right now. Cause I don't understand (laughs) that. It's like, I would lose my mind and I would break down into tears and I'd be like, I can't do this. I can't, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm terrible. And that was like, okay, I think I need to talk to someone, you know, like, because this shouldn't be shutting me down so hard, but it was like in the lack of control over everything else that was going on with, with, you know, I think a lot of us felt that like we have no say, which was both beautiful and kind of eye opening and also horribly, tragic for a lot of people to go i have no control oh no and i was like let me find ways to control the things in my world and unfortunately my dog my wife they were the things in my world and i was like okay we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this and this is how it's gonna be and all this stuff and it was like and my wife's like you gotta stop trying to do this to me like this this isn't working you're freaking out you're breaking down all the time you're crying (laughs) and because you cannot fathom a world where you have no control over something and i was like totally valid and so through the podcast my favorite murder like i, I told you before yeah, my favorite that, murder they were very open yeah, about therapy bring, and that sort of bring gave that me the bring that podcast into the story too we'll get back to the <clears throat> buddy holly stuff this is this is this is great because yeah. the a lot of performative storytellers and even storytellers who like a novelist you don't meet them you 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 interact with them through a book right. but actors especially this theatrical right um, your face your body your voice is the product ego is it is the product. Ego becomes hard. so difficult to manage sometimes. It, uh, who am I? Like they're tied together. Exactly. They're irrevocable. So we were we were talking about how your even your process as a storyteller has fundamentally shifted pre and post therapy. Mm. 
So you've mentioned your dog, you've mentioned the pandemic, and you did mention yes. to me a podcast that helped you decide to pursue therapy. And if you would start with that podcast and kind of then follow into what that what that journey was, that would be great. Yes, I will do that. And I'll also say what's nice about this is I think the story kind of ends with the oh, the arc of my buddy story, too. So I think they tie together in a nice way. Yes, I was on tour in 2018 and I found this podcast because I like tr I like true crime and I like mysteries and I like murder mystery stuff. And this podcast, My Favorite Murder, Karen Kilgariff and Georgia Hard Stark created this thing where they were just kind of reading murders, like true crime stories to each other and being sort of funny and charming and making like comments about it as podcasts are. But like this was sort of the dawn of. You know, I think podcasts are way, ob obviously, way more popular now than they yeah. were five years ago, I mean, even. And they were doing that, and I found it so fascinating to be sitting on the bus in my bunk and just trying to, like, get away from having to talk to people or having to be on as buddy. You know, it's like sort of my escape was to go into the little bunk on the bus. We had a little sleeper bus and just close the little flap thing and then listen to MFM, My Favorite Murder, and just sort of disappear. For those who don't know, and I know you do, it's like playing Buddy in that show. I don't know that the writers were like ever cognizant of the toll that it takes physically or vocally on the performer having to play Buddy. You have to sing 22 songs, you have to play guitar, and you're in 95% of the show of scenes. You're on stage. You have, I have counted it. In my past, even with the most luxurious of productions where they add in all the extra nonsense, you have maybe 15 minutes off stage and intermission. So 30 minutes total of the two and a half to 45 that this show can be. You have 30 minutes, including intermission, to not be on stage. It is grueling as a show. And you have a two show day. You're basically spending two hours at least per show on stage performing and singing and, and it is very hard and so imagine doing that and then you're also gotta you do one sometimes in a city you go to dubuque and you're like in there for like a day you do two shows you do a matinee you do you, and then you get on the bus and you sit on the bus for another hour as they drive overnight to the next city where you're gonna go do it for a weekend or whatever it is I th I think back on it. I'm like, that's insane. And then I think about people who are in shows where they're dancing their yeah. whole head off and they're having to do the same thing. And it's like, man, that's so hard. And it was so hard. So I just needed some time. That's when I started to go, I need time for me and stop being like the attention whore that we can be as performers sometimes and just be like, let's just like all hang out all the time and let's do it. And you go, <laughs> as you mature, I would listen to MFM. All of that to be said, I would listen to MFM and the true crime of it would just sort of embrace the darker side of myself where I really did believe in the back of my head that I was going to die young because I was producing so much art as a human being and constantly writing and constantly performing and constantly just doing this that I was like, I'm going to die young. I know it. I like believed it, that I was going to fall in the footsteps of like of a buddy who didn't choose to die you know but like a stevie ray vaughn or a buddy holly or a yeah a, anyone any of these young you know the, the 27 club i believed i was going to join you know like and i sort of became fascinated with that sort mm, of morbid yeah morbidness and it only fueled into my depression that at the time was undiagnosed you know and i just didn't know <laughs> that i was like consistently you know ideation you know suicidal ideation is no joke and i think anybody who has depression or has any neurodivergency or, or mental illness can attest to like, you don't know that it's weird until you don't know that it's not weird. Yeah. That's a bad word for it, but you don't know that it's not right. normal thinking until someone points out that they've never thought about it. And you're like, Oh, I am different in that way. You know, I just assume that these are thoughts that everybody thinks about, you know, and that sort of feeling of like that impending doom has always always did plague me and so but it would still be two years i mean we're still in 2018 when this is when i'm listening to this thing it was still two years out from me actually going to therapy but they talked so openly about therapy in the podcast and i continue to lose <laughs> <laughs> so much oh my god <laughs> it's like i love when you have a deep thought you're like you know the thing about humans is and you would burp you know it, it just like <laughs> overwrites whatever you were just doing yeah, it would still be two years, but I would still listen to them sort of religiously through those years. And they talk so openly about therapy and their own journeys with 
being attention seeking and 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 having alcoholism and all these other aspects of the like you know personalities or OCD and depression and and I felt like I was like yeah these people see they get me and they're so open about it and a lot of their fans the murderinos would write in and they'd be like you helped me through this and you helped me through this and I think that they realized that like by talking about it they were opening up the gate to for people to go yeah that's me cool okay so there is a way and they would talk about their therapists a lot and so when it came down to it and my wife was like i think you should probably talk to someone when we now we're in 2020 i was like oh yeah like they did all my favorite so i went to them and so like i was able to like use their resource that they would talk about on the thing to find a therapist which led me to my first therapist who was amazing and sort of led me out of that time of control and all those things and sort of let me look back and really made me analyze why am i doing so much what am i chasing what is that thing and and i and when i expressed to them that i was like well i think of my death quite a bit and i think about that i'm gonna die and they were like have you ever been diagnosed with like a depression and i was like no why you know i was like <laughs> why what makes you say that that would be you great <laughs> i was like i don't know what that is and she's like, I don't know that it's as serious as like, we need to like medicate you or call, you know, and have you be, she's like, but, but we'll start with some medication and we'll work on it and see if that helps. And then we'll, you know, and so that's, that's sort of where I began. And now I don't really take medication for it anymore, but it is part of my, you know, therapeutic journey still is like to mitigate that stuff. And, and my current therapist is aware of that. And, you know, you move and then, you know, licensing, you know, you lose the person sometimes. So all of that being said, so then post-pandemic, I go back to Buddy, and it sort of starts my journey to change why I'm doing what I'm doing and like my vision of like, okay, this is something I can do a billion times if I so choose, because that's how that show is. Same with Million Dollar Quartet, which I've done seven times. It's like people, you, you know it, so therefore you just yeah. get hired to do it, yeah. like sight unseen to the time, because it's like, well, we don't have to teach you. We know you're uh, you're tried and true, and like you said, and I'm very grateful that reviews of my performances, buddy, were so kind, and that really did help me throughout time with it. Get other jobs with it because people were like, "Oh, this guy is like the cream of the crop with it." And I can say that now, and that would sound uh, not worry if I'm sounding egotistical because. I no longer play right, the role, right. so I don't. I don't. <laughs> uh, I think I. I just don't play, it. and it's not because I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I think part of myself still wants to, because of the ego yeah. stroke that it comes with being the titular character and something that you know so well. You walk into that room and you're like, I know this character better than anyone. You know, period. You know, like I know this. And, and and that is such a powerful, wonderful thing, but it's so very fleeting and so very unfulfilling, I found out. And so I did the production right. at FST with you, and then I went immediately into a production at Florida Rep. And after those after that second one, I was asked to do it again for like four months. And yes, so I was offered to play the role again in utah i think they were like we want you to do the role and i was like i don't want to really do it anymore so i kept saying no to their offers but they kept asking and i was like i i, I just can't and i also can't do it for what you're offering the money and they're like well we don't go up in money so sorry and i was like no worries because that's right, an easy right, way i'm out. not negotiating like, you're like <laughs> <laughs> i'm not even trying to negotiate i'm just like if you want me to do this which i don't want to do you have to raise that to a point where it's like undeniable you know like i can't say no and when i did that they were like okay totally understand like we we don't move on this and i was like great now i can walk away from it and know that like it's on my terms and then they came to they were going to buy our set the the company was going to buy the set they saw pictures and they were like oh. we want that set for our production so they contacted the theater and they said can we buy the set from you and the theater was like sure and they were like, but we want to come check it out. We want to see what it's going to take and all that stuff. So they flew out the director and the artistic director and the TD to see the show. And they saw the show. And then the next day, my agent at the time called me and was like, so they're going up. <laughs> they want you that like. And I was like, I thought we were done with this. 
And of course, he's not going to be like, don't take it because yeah. it's like money. Right. So it's like he's like, think about it. Think about it. And I was like, I they went up. I didn't think they would ever go up. You know, like I just didn't think that we thought I thought it was done. But then it became a true thing. And then I had another offer at the time to do for way less money two plays I had never done and a play, which is like I've been doing musical theater and musical like actor musician shows for like the past five yeah. years at that time. Like I really hadn't done a play in like five years. And so I had an offer to do the nerd by Larry Shu and play Hank Williams, which again, actor musician show, but lost highway is a very good show. And the character has actual drama and that's great. And so I was like, Oh, it's a new role and a play that I wanted to do. Mm. I took that instead. And it was like, less than half of what they were offering me to do buddy i just couldn't yeah. do it again i was like i'm done i'm never gonna do better than these two back to back i can't it just got better and then i felt like the last time i did i was like i have mined this character for every ounce of what i could possibly do i could not act him any better than i am right now and it was such a healthy production for me because I finally felt like I conquered some other part of myself, which is that attention seeking sort of filling my bucket. And I felt like I was able to do that show and worry so little about whether the audience thought I was good or that my fellow actors gave me attention. I was just like, I'm going to do the role. And I felt like that was the first role and the first time I'd done the show where I was like, I don't care if people think I'm doing a good job. I'm just going to do the best I can and and put myself into it. And after that, I was like, well, what could I possibly do with it now? Like, that's the pinnacle. And I was like, I got to leave. And so even the offer to like go up in money and, and do whatever they wanted me to, whatever they were, they were going to do whatever they I asked essentially. And I was like, no. And that sort of ownership and power was just like hard. It's hard for us as performers. And I think any artist to just say no to anything period because we're taught you how to say yes because you never know when the next one's gonna blah, 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 blah. and there's really no power in that and i'm such an advocate for actor power because we have so very little is is to be like no for me this is nothing personal thank you but i just don't think i can do anything more with this and i think i'm going to step away from it so i sort of retired that day when i said no to that i had another couple offers that came through because people will never stop doing that show it's bonkers because it's not that good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can say that now. Of like the script is not good, and I've talked to them. They know the people who own the rights. I've talked to them. I will. I, I'll. I'll agree with you to and, a point. It's incredibly entertaining and goes all the way back to that nostalgia thing we were talking about. It is an yes, impactful hope. show, but yeah, oh, the yeah. dramaturgy needs some help. But that's okay. Yes, the, the, the book does not to live the music. up to the, yeah. the, the legacy of music yeah. that Buddy left us. And I think that's what sells the ticket, and that is justifiably worth the price of admission. I have no doubt. And people who came to FST, there was ushers who were like, I asked to usher this for the ninth yeah. time because of the show. So clearly, it touches people, and I think it's the nostalgia. A lot of older people obviously love the show, why it does so well in Florida. <laughs> but for me, as a, as a performer, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm getting nothing out of this anymore. So this sort of opportunity of like, here's to do the thing that gives you all the ego boost and all the love and adoration. And you're the titular character and you run, you're the head of the whole thing. And here's a lot of money or here's very little money, but a chance to do two things you've never done before for people who don't know you that well. And I took that one and it was like a huge relief for me as a, both an artist, a human being, a performer, because I was like, I didn't let my ego make the decision. I let my artistic desire take the f take the forefront. Mike, I hadn't realized that our production of Buddy Holly, the one I directed, was we had planned to do it before the pandemic, and it we were in the middle of all right. the design, all the preparation, and then got shut down. And it was one of the first shows we did coming out of the pandemic, and so it's interesting yeah. timeline wise that. For the theater reopening and you coming, it was your first production, as you said, post therapy, where you're working out this new process, this mm -hmm. new idea of ego. And I want to tell one quick story that I actually I included in my book, This Above All. Yes, yeah. it's right there I on my show. I love this story. <laughs> we were working the, okay. uh, people come out, the encore. I was like, couldn't remember the word encore. We were working the encore song and mm -hmm. we were jamming 
I think you'll recall that our musical director Spiff and I had made a very kind of open, yeah. best idea, wins, try anything. We don't have to do it the way it's always been done. Play, 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 play. Yeah, no wrong um, answers. And we were, as happens for the for listeners who maybe don't know the nuts and bolts of how an encore song typically works, there's always these like 16 bar pockets for each musician to, you know, show off. <laughs> it's like the here goes yeah. the awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the Last awesome dance. guitarist. Here's the awesome <laughs> piano riff. Here's everyone gets their yeah. moment in the spotlight. And at one point, as we were just bashing our heads against this encore, we came up to one of these musical breaks that was supposed to be yours. It was supposed to be one more Buddy Holly shreds for 16 bars. And you stopped us. Like you kind of just came to a stop. And you looked at me and, and looked at me and Spiff and said, Can we give this to Seth? And Seth was our, you know, Seth was our mm. platinum level drummer. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Seth. Um, you love him. And I know. Oh. But Seth hadn't had yeah. in this encore his 16 bar, let me show everyone just how brilliant I am mole. And you stopped the rehearsal because you'd had one in just the previous song. You even said, Jason, I just had yeah. one of these. Can, Seth hasn't had, can, we, can Seth take this one? And it wasn't in the sheet music. But I remember, I remember so clearly just kind of glancing at Spiff and he glanced at me and I'm like, well, heck yeah. I mean, that's awesome. You know, in the moment, yeah. it was just like, of course, <laughs> everyone should get a taste, right? Thinking back on it, yeah. and this kind of, I probably is, you need to, you know, tip your therapist. That's such a great example of putting the show before the ego. Right. Because then we also what yeah. the experience we got to have collectively watching Seth for 10 minutes, take over the room and build from scratch this drum solo when he's conducting everybody to like right. horns on two, hold back on Mike, can you pull back? Just he just took yeah. over Bam. and yeah. built from scratch this brilliant guitar, this brilliant drum solo that was just spellbinding. Oh, yeah. But great. that only happens if the buddy Holly, the band leader kind of calls everyone out and says, wait, 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 Seth hasn't had a turn yet. So I think to your point, the fact that this was post pandemic, yeah. post therapy oh, you. for you, you've been doing this show how many times you're looking for new things to play with. I mean, we found so many new things in that show, but that moment, oh that gosh. moment for me really stuck out as an example of what true collaboration is, what true artistic leadership is, what true putting ego behind the needs of the show is. I don't even know if you remember that, but that's, that's how, that's how I experienced I it. I remember it from the last time I remember, which was when I was reading your book and it was in the book and I went, oh yeah, that did happen. I do kind of remember that. But to me, it wasn't exactly. that big of a deal, uh, which is kind of funny, like yes. in a good way that like, like you're saying, it's like, I didn't think of it as like a big moment. It was just sort of like, it was like threefold. I do kind of remember just being like, well, do we need to hear me again? <laughs> I mean, we've heard me. For two freaking hours, two and a half hours of me doing so much stuff. It's like, let somebody else do something, please, please. Because it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Why, 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 why yeah. do we need to hear me again? It's so silly. And, and then on top of that, it's like, but what, what haven't we heard? And it's like, well, there is no drum solo in the show. So like, I, it does come back to me and like, and it's something that I think I just carried into the next one too, which was like, the last one was like, we do a drum solo <laughs> now. Like, <laughs> and they were like, "Oh, okay, great." You know, like, okay, whatever you say. And it, because it's like we don't know, we've never done it before, and it just kind of worked that way. And Armando right. was in that production too. He was the he was the Jerry in that production. And no, he wasn't. He wasn't. That was uh, my my one of my best friend Noah Barry. He was the Jerry Allison in in the Florida Rep production, and he was like, <laughs> "Oh heck yeah!" Thank you know? you. <laughs> it's like, "Oh," so, and we had done. And the thing is, and and I want to give a shout out to Noah Barry on that one too. And I give a shout out to Seth. Seth is an amazing drummer, amazing person, and we were roommates during FST's production of Buddy, so we just got along like gangbusters and talked right. about the show. He was also my understudy. Went on like eight times when I got really sick. He he's an amazing amazing performer amazing guy and Noah Barry who's one of my best friends in the whole world he and I have done seven oh. shows together and four oh. of those have been buddy it's, it's crazy it's crazy because it's he's sort of the guy that I'm like I recommend him because he has no ego and he should so I'm his <laughs> ego and I'm the one who's like you know who you should hire Noah Barry I love him I think he's very great and he when we did that show he was always just so game. He was just so game to do it. And I love that both him and Seth were just like, oh, heck yeah. Like, oh, yeah, sweet. Like, I've always wanted to do that. But no, I didn't think I had the the the, 
the wherewithal. And I think that like, that just speaks to like, if you have the power of the room and you have any power in the room that yeah. you can be that person to just go, I, I don't ask me what would you guys want to do? And it's like, it suddenly shifts the dynamic and then it yep. becomes an ensemble, which it really is when yep. you're playing music together. It's like, it can't be one person's thing because then it's just boring. So that's, it's really cool that, 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 that stuck with you because it was in re-experiencing, like I said, in re, re in reading that in the book uh, that I was like, Oh yeah, I yep. did. That did happen. But yeah, it wasn't, it didn't seem that big, but now when I look back on it, I'm like, yeah, that is a huge step. I think that's part um, of the point though, Mike, is that if it for, seemed big to you in the moment, that's actually ego. The fact that it didn't seem big is the whole point. Right. 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 And what was what's right. interesting too, as the director on a show like this, because uh, most of the cast had done the show at, multiple times. Right. Part of that was intentional because yeah. we only I had need- three weeks rehearsal. So it was like, Hey, if we can have a head start, that's mm-hmm. good. But then on the director, that, that, that could be a bit of a pressure because everyone's going to have their favorite way they did it. Everyone's going to have their own interpretation oh, of, yeah. well, I did it this way. You know, I've, I've done this show way more than you have, Jason. So you need, you know. You know what really is awesome <laughs> when we do this? And don't question it because you don't know. And it's like, so, it, that's kind of sad. Part of, but true. part of the way as a director that I had to work to subvert that was to welcome yeah. ideas almost to a fault sometimes. And then like, let everyone prove, oh, well, that one doesn't work with this group in this production anymore, right? I had, I, I had to right. kind of very intentionally, my directorial ego is way across the street because I have to let you all fall on your face to prove that the idea <laughs> yeah. from four shows ago doesn't work here. And it's not a judgment on you. It's just, it's, this is a different show. And I'll rem- I, I remember this other moment, Mike, we were working yeah. with the song, It's Raining in My Heart. Such a good song, Love right? right? No. And we split it. We split the focus between Beautiful. you and the, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name. Brilliant. Troy, thank you. Troy, Troy wherever you are, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Troy playing, playing the sax. And yeah. Troy brilliant, Rucker. brilliant saxophone Shout player. Out. And we split the focus on the two of you, put you in a conversation. So there was a moment where you were doing the lyrics and we had a real, all of a sudden, heart to heart. I don't know if you remember this either, but the lyrics, what the, the way that song ticks, it's a very sweet sounding song. Right. And the lyrics are all, it's beautiful. And then it pivots into, but it's raining, right? The sky is blue. The sun is shining. The birds singing. Right. Everything's great, except in my heart, it's clear. Raining. And yet, and we had, and matter, I, yeah. whether it was from a previous production or it was just that day, you weren't locking into that ironic pivot in the lyric. Right. Even, oh. and, and that's the danger of doing a show seven right. or eight times is that it can become rote. Yeah, it exactly. just goes on autopilot sometimes. Exactly. Yeah, you go. Well, this one is just we'll, we'll power through this. And then, so, mm-hmm. so my job is not to say bad actor. My job is to be like, just remember the lyric, dude. You've got this. You do know this better than me, but you're just missing this one little thing right now, right? <laughs> don't yeah. forget to tell the story. Like, don't forget to tell the story of what you're saying. And I think that they can take a back seat, like you said. It does. It takes a back seat sometimes to the music. It sounds pretty enough. But and does it mean go, anything? Right. And people would, and I think that most people would agree. And, and I'll be so bold as to say, if you don't agree, reassess <laughs> something about yourself. And, and what, but wait, that sounds cruel, but I think that most people would prefer to hear a meh sounding vocal with yeah. good storytelling than a really good sounding vocal. Louis Armstrong, no man, right? Um, Louis Armstrong in no way yeah, has yes, beautiful yeah, I mean, most quote unquote stars. voice, right? But man, does he paint the picture, no. right? He paints the picture so well. And you can have a beautiful voice mm-hmm. that doesn't paint the picture and it'd still be pretty and you still listen to it, but you don't stop and go, whoa, whoa, I never heard that before. You just kind of go, right. yeah, they can sing. And I think the difference between they can sing and I hear the song are oh, two different things. And yeah. It's vast. It's a valley. And I think you're 100% right. And I was. I sort of, you know, you do it that many times. And you perform it. I mean, I have performed the show. And yeah. Troy, to his to his point too, yeah. he had done it more than I have. I think at that point he had I done know. it 15 times right. as that role. So like he had become sort of like, this is just how it goes. And we were just like, and we had done it together twice before. And so like, we were just like, yeah, okay, cool. This is how it goes. And this is what we do. And you being able to go, hold on, hold on. What are we saying? It sort of makes you go, you know, I don't know. <laughs> actually, like, I knew you know, you're like, I stopped ago. listening. <laughs> Yeah. When I first did this song, it mattered because I was trying to learn it. But when I've done it, you know, a thousand times, basically at that point, I've sung that song. I stopped thinking about what I was saying. 
and and it didn't matter to me. This, um, is, this is great. I want to use this to to pivot really quick before we wrap. Mm. It's, I've seen this either in interviews or on your website. I forget exactly where I saw it, but you have a because you're also a prolific writer, and the kind of the go to is well, write what you know. But you have a little twist on that. You like to say. Mm -hmm. Write what you wish you didn't know, which is sort of what we're talking about with this song, right? That you know it so well, you forget you know what you know. But when when Mike, yes. the playwright, says, write what you wish you mm. didn't know, unpack that for us out here. I, absolutely. It, it goes back to, I started writing in college because I became fascinated with the other side of like, Okay, I'm acting these words. I, you know, I went to school for just straight acting. I didn't go for musical theater. We didn't have a musical theater program at Towson. It was just like you just learned drama and you learned the techniques and they sort of threw you into whatever was going on. And it was very overwhelming, but also very useful because they made you learn everything. You, you didn't just act. You were like you had to do stage crew. You had to build sets. You had to hang lights. You had to do those things to graduate. So it creates this sense of like, oh, this is a this isn't just about me being on stage and getting applause. This is about a team of people putting something together. And I think it creates a more well-rounded and like accepting kind person backstage as well, because you know what everybody's going through because you did it. And you're like, ah, dude, please. I understand that this is an ask because I've been here, even though it was brief for me, this is your life, you know? And, and so all of that being said, it goes back to this thing where I was so fascinated with, okay, I'm acting these words, but like, how do you even get to the point that these words mean anything to me, you know, now? And like, where do they come from? How do you build that? So I became fascinated with playwriting and just writing in general. I'd always been a lyricist since I was like a kid, because I always just wanted to like write songs. P plays were interesting because I had not until that point really thought about their construction and what, what mattered. And so I ended up writing my senior thesis on write like an actor, what actors, what playwrights uh, can learn yeah, from yeah, acting yeah. technique. And, and I took uh, Michael Schiff's book, acting Audition. Book he has in the history of acting books. <laughs> so good. And the yep. 12 guideposts were my sort of framing device for my thesis, which was like, if you answer these questions, even if like just briefly in your own mind, you don't have to like write out every character because that can be exhausting. Not everybody works that way. Um, but like if you think while you're writing a scene, OK, so what does my character think is funny? What is this character keeping a secret from this other character? What you know, all of the things that he asks you to do in the 12 guideposts, the secret, the where's the love and where, what are you hiding from them? What do you hate? What makes you laugh? You just briefly think about those things. It suddenly opens up a sense of I am going to give you the actor this character and all the answers are there, but you can find them. But I know that they're there for me. And and so that became really fascinating. So that's sort of what I wrote my thesis on. And from that point forward, when I graduated, I became enamored with the idea of like building more worlds for the kind of writing and the kind of characters that I wanted to play and making sure that every role in a play, because I had also played some roles in college where I was like, this doesn't need to be in this play. And I feel stupid playing this role because I don't, there's nothing to do. I come on and I do like the scene and it doesn't matter versus like, Every character is it has to be necessary. Every moment should be necessary. And I should never write a character that I don't want to play. Oh, yeah. You know, like, I always cut that character. If I wouldn't take the, the contract because it's been because it's beneath me as an actor, to be like, well, they say two lines. Why would I want to play that role? You know, like, artistically speaking, maybe it's a paycheck. That's fine. But the point of it is I don't want my text to be a paycheck for someone. I want them to want to play the character as much as I wanted to write the character. And so going back to that in my, in my writing of the thesis without trying to sound, I feel like some of this sounds pretentious. But it's a thesis, fine. man. Um, it's a thesis. <laughs> it's a thesis. It sounds pretentious, but I was studying Edward Albee and Edward Albee is notoriously a bit of, was notoriously yep. kind of a curmudgeon. But the one thing he said is in, in one of my interviews that I read with him was the, the person said, do you subscribe to what people say about writing is right, which you know? And he said, God, no. He's like, if I wrote what I knew, it would be boring because I don't know that much. And he goes, I'd rather write about what I don't know. And I found that to be extraordinarily. I was like, oh, finally, I understand now. He's like, I don't, he's like, I have never been an academic having people over for dinner and divorcing my wife. That's not something I've lived, but I've felt those things and I've witnessed those things. I just don't know them. Like, so I wanted to know them. 
And I think that's fascinating. Like, you know, that these great works of drama, it's like, he didn't live that. He experienced the f- moments and that became really fascinating to me. So in all of that, r- recently with my with my writing, as I've matured, is writing what I'm afraid mm-hmm. to know. Like what I'm, uh, because cause even though you can, you can know something and be afraid of it, you know, and I think it's really fascinating. And one of my co-stars in the play that I just closed, Hester Street, Danny Stoller, amazing playwright. And we had seen a reading of her newest play and it was really, really personal, and I won't go into like too much detail, but she was writing, sort of facing things that I think she herself was afraid to like say about herself, and she then she puts it in the play, and, and now a room full of people can hear how she feels, and what she went through, and, and the bad sides too. The character that was focused on her was not initially very likable, because you're like, oh, that's, I don't know if I like you. And... I think that speaks to that. And we've had these discussions where it's like, I'm not interested. We're not interested in writing plays where if I write what I knew, every character would be a white 30 something right. cis male. And no one wants to read that. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> like I don't want to read. I don't exactly. I right. wouldn't want to <laughs> see my own story. Like, so I try to write about things that makes me put myself in other yeah. people's shoes. So like I'll write stories, that, but, but, but shoes that I can at least attempt to understand through knowing friends yeah. and knowing myself. So it's like through being in a relationship with my wife. Now we've been together 15 years. It's like, I feel like I can confidently write women and not feel like I am going to make them a, just a man with a, with a, with a, a, right. an identity of a woman, you know, like I think that she has been such a, such a help to me in a million ways in a multitude of ways that I cannot express that, you know, how much she has changed my life. But, but in my writing, she always gets to visit it first and, and she gets to see that world first and she can be like, I don't know why this is happening. And I'm yeah. like, thank you. Yeah. Neither did I clearly, I just thought it was cool, you know, or whatever. And, and I think that that sort of honesty. So it's like, yeah, I don't know too much. The play that I just finished is about a couple that is it's sort of a pinter play kind of send up but it kind of accidentally became a pinter play in itself and it's called garbage people and it's about this couple that breaks up and the ex comes back to the the apartment and it's sort of revealed that the the reason why they broke up was because he was having an affair with her brother while they were together and hiding it from her but she knows and so it's like this sort of trio where like the siblings are dating the same person and now they're confronting it and it sort of gets violent and out of control. And right. I've never experienced that. I've never been in a relationship with someone's sibling. And then like, you know, I've never done that, but I have been in that place where you have something you really dr- greatly wish to apologize for. And you just don't know how to do it because in doing so you will take the ownership of yeah. being a bad person or making a mistake or being selfish. And that's what I wrote from. And so it's like, what I'm afraid to know is that I have been that person who has hurt someone and been so scared to admit it because that would mean that I have to question my morals and my decision-making and that I have hurt them. That's what I'm afraid to confront. So that's what the play is about. And I think a lot of us are afraid. And and we there was a reading of it uh, the, Mar- uh, the the Maryland Theater Collective did a reading of it about four months ago. And I was really sh- scared that the audience would be like, this is too strange. I don't care about these people. Like, they're terrible. They're terrible. I mean, they're, it's called dark people. <laughs> they're not good. But I don't think anyone truly is. They're just selfish, and I'm laying it bare. And they thought it was so funny and scary. They were like, I was really worried about what was going to happen. I thought that there was somebody who was going to die. And I was like, Oh, shocking. You know, like yeah. that shook me because I was like, I didn't think that I was, you know, I think a lot of writers, we, we go, I don't know if I'm going to get this. <laughs> the key like, person is I maybe we don't do. either. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. So, so all of that is to say, that's the very long answer to write what I'm afraid to know or write what I don't know is more interesting to me because of the fact that like Edward Abbey said, what I know is very limited, but what I'm afraid to know is how I've sort of co-opted it for myself, which is, I'm not sure that I want to confront that. And therefore, I should write that. And I think that that makes it interesting to me. That's drama. Mike, this has been so fascinating. And we're going to wrap up now. I'll always start with these two questions in a spotlight to wrap up. Question number one okay. is, uh, yes. what is the best advice that you have ever taken? That I have taken? It has 
taken me some time to actually take this advice, but I think it goes back to what we talked about today. One of my professors in college at Towson University, Peter Ray, is his name. He once said, if you are, as an actor, it's so hard to think of yourself as, uh, this is paraphrasing, but the actual quote that is coming is, is, is what he said. But he was like, it's so hard to believe that you were chosen sometimes for, to do it and that you're not good enough and that you have to prove yourself. Now, you've gotten the role. Now I have to show you I deserved it. And he's like, you don't. Once you have been cast, you will do for the role. Mm. You don't have yeah. to prove it anymore. Just do. And I wanted to believe that from the moment he said it back when I was a junior in college. And it has taken me until I would say this year to actually put it into my actual heart and, and, and go, I don't have to prove that I deserve the role. I probably even until this role, I mean, this role that I just did, I'm you, you've seen me. I'm, I am the face often. I'm the clown. I, I understand comedy. I, I can be a silly person very easily. And this role was like stillness, very few texts, like not a whole lot of text, but on stage quite a bit. And person I don't know, a, a, an Orthodox Jewish man who was going to become a rabbi for 10 years, studied at the yeshiva, and then decided to give it up because he wanted a life where he could marry who he wanted to marry and be with the person and build a life he wanted without any rules, except for the fact that he still greatly believes in a lot of these rules that are tied into who he is. Not someone I know. And it was very anxious to play someone like that because I was like, this is not my comfort. He is not funny. Like he is not, he's funny in the way that he's so serious that it makes moments funny. I'm the straight man, which I'm usually not often right. the straight man in roles. I'm usually like the clown. And it was a learning process for me to like release that part of myself that I thought was so intrinsic to my value as an actor, which is like, I'm funny, therefore I'm worth something. And it was like, no, you don't get to be funny with this person per se. It's not about how well you make people laugh. That has yeah. no value here. <laughs> it's about how much heart you bring and how much quiet and stillness you bring. And I was like, I don't know anything <laughs> about that. <laughs> as I've proven here, I do enjoy a talk. And to have a character that doesn't get to speak very much. No, that, so, that's great. I, um, I... That's the best yeah, advice that's, I've taken. That's a really good one. I both when I was primarily an actor and then also even as a director, you can feel that at the first table read. And you know, mm -hmm. especially if there's like producers or donors or backers in the room too, that pressure to perform, right. that pressure to prove that the director in theater didn't make a mistake bringing you in. <laughs> it's so it's such a oh false my God, no. narrative, but man is it and it, it it just worms. I've seen it especially as a director, I see it. And so I try to, I, I've, I've tried multiple different strategies to kind of subvert that energy at first table reads. I haven't found one that works all the time, but no, that that's a gremlin that right. does not need any more <laughs> oxygen. That's for sure. It doesn't need any fuel. Oh my God. So true. And it's, and it's because like as much as you could do as a director, and I, and I know that you have done this and I, and I believe that you have done this for others as well, is like you try to make them yeah. relaxed and comfortable and that they are yeah. suited for it. Um, yes. But it's all internal. It's like trying to make someone change. It's like yeah. it has to come from inside it. And it's really hard yes. to witness. <laughs> I'm sure you witness it more than like I feel it, but I right. don't witness it as much as a director sitting in the room goes. They're trying oh, way they're, too hard. They're yeah, still they're trying still to get the role. They're still, still trying to book. Yeah, they're still <laughs> booking. Yeah. It's just like you're already You've here. moved into housing, uh, right? I mean, you you're here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like you, you got it. You signed the contract. The, you don't. You're not. But there's that fear. I think a lot of actors have that they're yeah. going to lose it. Yeah, it's going to be taken from them. That it is so temporary that that they could be replaced at any time, which is really sad. Great. Right, second question: What what is the worst Please. advice that you have ever given? Oh God. The the th sort of funny and honest <laughs> part of it is, I think I I. A lot of, I, I don't know where to start. I, I think I have in the past given some very bad advice and a lot of it was probably like about working too hard or trying to like produce, you know, like just be busy. I think the worst advice that I had given, it's not even advice per se, but it was like this belief that I would purport that I would bring to other people, which was that like, if you weren't working as an actor, mm. you're not an actor. 
I believe that and I would spread that like uh, mm. a plague upon people and I would and I feel so guilty now but I kind of have to relinquish that because it was a different person I felt like a different person that I believe that that I would look down upon other performers who were like I haven't acted in a show in four years but I'm still acting and it's like and I would be like no you're yeah not. and it's like I had to separate the logic of it from the emotion of how I felt about it. It's like, theoretically speaking, you're not currently acting. Yes, a, a true, but that doesn't not right. make you an actor. It's like where I needed to separate myself. And I was just so focused on the doing that I stopped thinking about like the actual emotional impact of it. So I think I may have spread... I'm not saying that I ever gave that as advice. I don't think that is advice. But I think that I accidentally would spread that, that sort of that mindset and and live that mindset for a little while and this was like during my time before therapy really made me f look at myself and go like well why am i yeah. even doing it and having to assess that but before then yeah I, I i was sort of bringing that judgment with me places and i look back and i go oh yeah so toxic it's so toxic why why would i do that it was me going, if I'm not working, right. then I have no value because I needed so much external validation to yep. fill my bucket, like I said. And now that I don't need to fill it with all of that, it's like nice to get the role. It's nice to be desired, but I don't hinge my experience and my work on that anymore because I understand yeah. how hard it really is to be that. And, and some people just aren't even in a place where they yeah. want to, yeah. too, you know? Oh, Mike, so much good stuff. So let me uh, put the spotlight on you here for people out there listening who want to learn more about you or what shows you have coming up or play readings or anything else. How can they find you, follow you, contact you? They can find me. I think I'm most active on Instagram. So it's at Mike Perry Jr. P E R R I E J R. You can find me there often, or you can go to my website, Michael Perry Jr. At com to see what I'm up to. Up next is I We'll be doing Beautiful at Olney Theater Center. I'm playing Jerry Goffin and Beautiful at Olney Theater Center in Olney, Maryland from July through the end of August. So it's like a two-month run. It's a big run. And so I'm very excited about that. After that, I'm directing the film that I wrote. It would be my first oh! feature film that I'd be directing that my wife and I, Lacey, and I wrote together. It's called The Conspiracists. So if you're looking to be a part of a film, you know, you can reach out to me and whatever that means to you <laughs> and yeah it's a, it's a mockumentary about conspiracy theories and it's something that we started writing in the pandemic times you know when we were watching a lot of documentaries and we thought oh well this is an interesting story about hmm. community really let's let's sort of use that as our way in to like it's a lampooning of our desire to be a part of yeah, something yeah. um bigger than ourselves and what we would do to do that and sort of the the walls we put in front of ourselves while we're doing it but yeah friends of mine are producing they have a production company. They read the script. They love it. And it's really exciting and scary and wonderful. So to getting into that. So that's sort of what I'm working on this year. And then we'll yeah, see yeah. where that goes. Who knows? That'll be <laughs> so, so, so that's a big thing. That's a big thing. That's an undertaking that's on the horizon. But yeah, find me there. And if you're looking for my writing and you want to say I'm on NPX, you could just go to the National Play Exchange and it's Michael Perry Jr. And you just look me up and all of my awesome. favorites are up there. And everyone, I'll put all these stuff. links to all these various things in the show summary so you can click and find Mike right there. Mike, thank you so much for your time and your stories you. and your vulnerability today. Really, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it too. I, I loved it. The Page and Stage podcast is built with Alitu, the all-in-one podcasting app created by the amazing team over at thepodcasthost.com. You can learn more about all my guests and access their websites and projects in the episode summaries. If you enjoyed and found value in this podcast, please tell at least one other person. Word of mouth has always been and will always be the best marketing tool in the world. Thank you for listening. And until next time, I'm Jason Cannon. And I cannot wait to hear your story.